All right. All right, and we'll be in the Department of Sociology on Wednesday morning and in the Department of Family and Environment on Wednesday afternoon. And we'd be pleased to invite you to e either of those discussions if you're interested in those. The morning one will be on <coughs> family theory, the afternoon one dealing with marriage counseling. He has been in Des Moines today publicizing a new book which is coming out called Couples. Uh, he also has a textbook which will be released very soon. It's my pleasure to introduce my very good friend and my doctoral advisor, Carlford Broderick. I take it that's for having been her doctoral advisor, and I, I appreciate that. That was one of my better pieces of work, I think. Well, I'm delighted to be here, um, although I'm a little intimidated by at least some of the people that I see here who know a great deal about the subject I'm going to talk about. Um, I wanted to talk kind of an update of the American family because um, all of us know that things have changed around from what they were three or four or five years ago, but probably some of you don't have the occasion that I have to uh, follow the various uh, statistics and issues that change and uh, get a, as clear a picture as maybe my profession forces me to get of the way things have turned around in a very uh, dr dramatic way in a very short time. Uh, I suppose the year 1975 will turn out to be one of those saddle point years um, as historians of the future um, look at the family in America. Um, 75 was the year that all of the trends of the previous decade and really in some ways of the previous 20 years reached a uh, fruition, reached the height of the chart, and turned back in some ways. Um, for example, uh, the divorce rate actually went down for the first time in 20 years uh, in 1976 from 1975. 75 was the highest uh, rate um, ever in uh, American divorce. We have never had any near competitors in terms of our divorce rate. Uh, Egypt uh, flirted with us for a while. Uh, on, uh, on being the most uh, uh, divorced nation, but uh, we pulled resolutely ahead <coughs> or the Egyptians fell behind. Uh, uh, anyway, we reign in solitary splendor as the world's foremost divorcers. Um, but uh, 1976 was below 75, 77 was uh, also below 75. Uh, this year, this last year, 78, which we're just getting the statistics on, uh, looks like it may be back up to 75 level, but uh, it's really been a period of stability when it, people were projecting exponential curves uh, right off the wall, when it looked like if you projected the slope of the, uh, of the divorce curve, which was increasing, 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 why um, people were projecting all kinds of instability in the future, uh, greater even than what we've had in the past. Um, and it appears that we've reached some momentary, anyway, saturation point uh, uh, where the forces of individual growth and uh, rights and uh, uh, opportunities and uh, freedoms, um, which are terribly important in our culture, I suppose probably few cultures, in few cultures is that considered a more core value, are beginning to be balanced a little bit by people's um, sense of the need for uh, stability and continuity and uh, safety, security. Um, there are other manifestations of that same trend, um, um, which some of which I'll, I'll uh, come back to as we go along. Um, some other things took a saddle point that year. Um, the marriage rate dropped through, for 70 was the high, highest year for marriages, again, in the United States history. And at that time, we were the leaders in the world and the number of people who got married by the age of 40. 75.6 percent of us got married by the age of 40 as of 1970, which put us head and shoulders above anybody else. 
then we started retreating from marriage, partly by virtue of um, the marriage, uh, I don't want to get into the demography of it, but partly because of the ages of the children that we have and the fact that we have a tendency to marry people, uh, men marry women two to four years younger than themselves. And when we keep flipping around, flopping around on our birth rates, as we'll talk more about in a minute, uh, it leaves very odd patterns. You get a bunch of uh, uh, kids all born at a single time, and when they grow up and suddenly hit the marriage market, um, the, the women hit the marriage market first, right, because they become 20 and 21 and 22 and ready to marry, while the men are 20 and 21 and 22 and not ready to marry quite for another couple of years. And those women look around for somebody to marry, and um, they weren't born. You see, um, and uh, so they start competing with uh, the uh, upcoming cohort of women who are after their own age mates, and they start competing for their own age mates, which would be all right, except then who are those younger sisters going to marry <laughs> since their age, the ones they were, you know, and so it forces a terrific competition for men, uh, and under those circumstances, a lot of people got married. As I say, in 1970, we had more people married than watched television, which was a pretty good uh, achievement, I think. Uh, um, two million people a year were getting married. That was really a very, very high level. And then it started to drop down since 70, um, and seems again in 75 to have bottomed out at about 93 percent, leaving Egypt again, those Egyptians. That's a more competitive group than you might think just from uh, watching the peace negotiations. Uh, I mean, uh, with the Israeli, he'll negotiate. But on matters of divorce and marriage, they seem to be right out there neck and neck in front. And uh, the Egyptians now uh, have a higher marriage rate than we do, and so do the Russians. Now, I don't know if you want to run home and write your congressman to tell them that the Egyptians and the Russians are ahead of us and the number of us that are getting married and they ought to pass a bill. But um, it appears that that's not continuing to go down. We're not in any danger of uh, dropping below the levels of places like Canada and England and let alone places like um, France or Sweden or Ireland, which has the lowest marriage rate of anybody and has had forever. Uh, they don't marry till very late. And uh, some of them, of course, uh, come to America as priests and nuns and they don't marry at all. Uh, although, did you read on the, did you hear the Pope today was urging American priests to stay celibate. If they're going to take the vows, do it, you know, or don't do it or whatever. But anyway, uh, uh, apparently they had some problem. We had, in fact, in the, at 70, in the year that um, two million people married uh, and that we had the highest marriage rate in the world, even priests and nuns were getting married. And we had 10,000 of them that year in America. Uh, so that everybody was marrying. I mean to say, <coughs> you know, no matter what your excuse was, it wasn't good enough not to marry in those years. Uh, um, now, but as I say, 75 seems to have been the bottom of the trough for the time being, and uh, because of the low birth rates, we're coming to a time when uh, it'll be the men who will be looking around for spouses because, of course, they'll be left over from the large population boom and the young women that they would prefer to marry two or three years younger than themselves weren't born uh, because of the decreasing rate. And so when that bunch hits, which it will in the early 80s, uh, then, girls, you'll have your revenge. <coughs> and uh, all that scrambling and scurrying that uh, you had to do uh, in the early 70s uh, the fellas will have to be doing. They'll be robbing the cradles. They'll be haunting the high schools, uh, looking for unmarried females. <coughs> um, so I, things are looking up, ladies. You should be better treated uh, in the 80s. Um, one of the things that's happened is that marriage is getting later and later, um, even among those who do marry, so that um, Although the marriage, the number of people who marry by the age of 40 has only dropped down to 93 percent. Uh, at, at the, in the mid-20s, the number who remain unmarried has almost doubled um, because people are living together or otherwise postponing marriage uh, until the later 20s. Um, that may be one of the reasons that the divorce rate has stabilized because 
the most stable marriages are marriages of women who marry in the early to middle 20s and men who marry in the middle to late 20s. And there have been a great deal more of them. And that may be one of the things that contributes to a stable, um, a stabilized divorce rate temporarily. We don't know. Who, I don't make any predictions for the future. Um, now, the fertility has been very interesting. I don't want you to confuse fertility, which is having at least one child, with uh, the birth rate, which has a lot more to do with how many children people have. But let's just talk about fertility, first of all. Um, you, um, taking a long-range view, you may be interested to know that um, we have a much higher fertility rate now than we did at the turn of the century. At the turn of the century, about 25% of women never had a child. Um, many of them, first of all, the marriage rates were lower. Uh, it's hard to realize that in those days, uh, not very many school systems would hire a married woman teacher. If she got married, she had to leave because it was considered that she should be home with her family. Uh, it's hard to realize that many communities, including some here in Iowa, had laws that if a woman married, she couldn't teach in their schools. Uh, so that was a whole profession, um, the single uh, school teacher. But um, also, there were a lot more reasons um, that had to do with nutrition and medical care and so on, why women were not fertile, and men. Uh, it used to be always a woman who bore the burden of infertility. If some, she didn't have a baby, it was considered her fault. Um, we now know from the studies that it's usually about 50-50. Um, and it, again, it was about the turn of this decade, about 1970, that we had the highest fertility rates in our history. That is, we had more women having at least one child than ever before. It was about um, 91% of our women had at least one child. Of the ones who did not, about 5% uh, were involuntary and the rest uh, voluntary. Um, now, since 1970, the number of involuntarily infertile women has increased. That is, the number of women who wish they could have a baby, want to have a baby, try to have a baby, and can't have a baby have increased. Um, they've done a lot of speculating and some scientific work, but a mixture of both. Uh, their best explanations are, there are two or three reasons uh, why more women today who want babies can't have them. Um, one is venereal disease, gonorrhea. We have, we're in a continuing gonorrhea epidemic. Uh, partly a product of our changing sexual mores. Um, and gonorrhea is much more difficult to diagnose than, um, especially in women, than uh, our other forms of venereal disease, particularly syphilis, which breaks out in a sore, whereas gonorrhea just uh, often is just a, a drip, and it's not always easy to detect. Um, but it closes fallopian tubes, and uh, has similar uh, consequences in the male. And uh, so we've had a tremendous number of uh, women with venereal disease who have, as a result, become uh, infertile. Multiple abortions seems to be uh, implicated. Um, the use of the pill in younger women, since um, there's at least one study that indicates that in a population of women on the pill, it takes about 40 months for that population to re-achieve its pre-pill fertility rate. Well, that is not its pre-pill, its non-pill fertility rate, uh, a comparable group of women who weren't on the pill. pill. Um, um, later marriage and later uh, entry and ready, later trying to get pregnant. Many women who were marginally fertile at uh, 23 who put off having children until 28, cross the margin uh, in the process. Uh, as all of you know, women are born with every egg they will ever have, unlike men who are generating them ludicrously you know, all the time. Uh, um, and uh, 
those eggs in women age, and as they age, uh, some die, and so by the time a woman is perhaps 35, um, she might have 10,000 left, which seems like enough unless you're very ambitious, of course. Um, uh, but that's as compared to 500,000 that she had uh, when she was born. And so the ratio, as you can see, is uh, very sharp. And uh, so for all those reasons, more women today than in 1970, but still many, many fewer than 1900, are unable to have children that want children. Now, voluntary childlessness peaked in 1975. 1967, 2.5% of the women said they never wanted to have a baby ever. I don't want one of them, you know. Um, that went up almost three times to 6.7. Um, in college groups, it went up higher. It went up almost 9% uh, among college-educated women uh, in 1975. 1975 was a peak year of women not wanting to have a baby. Um, and then it was down again to 5.5% in uh, 76, and it's down again since then. And it appears that, in fact, we're in the midst of a baby boom among women 35 years and older who've never had a child. Um, they're going out and getting their tubes reconnected and vasectomies uh, repaired and uh, it's sort of the last hurrah for people who said when those studies were done in 1970 that they never wanted a baby and now are thinking, on the other hand, I may never have a baby if I don't have a baby now. And uh, It's curious, really. It's the largest um, in recent history. We've never had a group of 30 to 35-year-olds with as many babies because uh, usually that's been the tapering off time for people who had all their babies in their 20s. And now people who never had babies are suddenly saying, if I'm going to have a baby, let's, this is it. And I think it's, that's one of the strongest indicators that our whole culture is um, mellowing out from the 60s, uh, which were very independence-oriented, very existential, very um, freedom and uh, keeping your options uh, open-oriented. Uh, now, um, while I'm talking about children, one of the saddest, uh, one of the saddest results of that period of time was uh, what happened to the commune babies, to the babies that, that were raised in communes in the 60s. Uh, uh, there was one 10-year follow-up study that was done, and only one, and this may not be representative, but it was so sad that uh, um, maybe because a lot of us, I think, sort of who lack the courage to do anything like that themselves. We go out and live with a group and open lifestyle and multiple parenting and not send the kids to school and not lay any guilt trips on them and so on. A lot of people, I think, who didn't have the courage to do anything like that themselves still had fantasies that the kids were pretty damn lucky that, that were raised that way and that they'd turn out without any kind of problems that our kids had, no rebellion because they're not rebel against, and you know, they'd, that they'd turn out to be a really mellow together group. And the sad thing is that 10 years later, they turn out to be two years developmentally retarded, undernourished, drug addicted, sexually abused, physically abused. Um, it turns out that everybody's children were nobody's children, and that those who wanted to uh, live um, in terms of their own senses and so on were not very good parents. Uh, they were not very responsible. And that's sad, I think, because, as I say, even those who did not participate in that movement, I think, had many fantasies uh, and idealisms that vicariously were being lived out uh, through it and, uh, and turned out to be sadly uh, uh, disappointing. Um, one of the areas that um, people have, uh, have uh, had very high hopes would change, and that where there have been some changes and some other things as we'll discuss that aren't so different, um, was been the area of division of labor between men and women. In the marketplace, as you know, women have made tremendous, tremendous gains, although much remains to be done still. Um, 
any of us who are long enough, who have been around long enough to notice, uh, uh, are impressed with the changes. I think there's been a shift as dramatic as the civil rights movement uh, shift of the previous decade. Um, but if you look at what has happened in the home, in the division of labor, um, again, it turns out not to be very uh, disappointing for those who thought that there might be some real changes. Because all of us know people who have flexed up their sex roles and uh, maybe even reversed them and so on. Um, but that seems to be, um, in fact, a study was done just a little ways from here as the crow flies. Uh, in a suburban uh, community, and uh, one was done in Stanford and one was done in Illinois. And all of them showed that, as compared to 20 years ago, in the division of labor in the home, it hadn't changed a bit. Women still do 80% of the work, men do 10%, children do 10%, and that's what they did 20 years ago. Now, if you ask the women, how come men don't do more of the work, they say, well, to tell you the truth, by the time you've motivated him to do it, and set it up for him to do, and supervised his doing it, and cleaned up after him, it's easier to do it yourself. <coughs> um, one of the things that f made people feel that the labor would be redistributed was the increase, the steady increase of the number of women in the labor force. But study after study after time study after time study uh, seems to show that it doesn't work out that way. Uh, when a woman goes into the labor force, uh, she cuts her housework her, uh, and her time with her children about in half, from eight hours a day on the average to four hours a day. And her husband doubles his from 12 minutes a day, or from six minutes to 12 minutes. Uh, now, if you just look at percentages, that looks even. <coughs> uh, but uh, if you look at the actual amount of help, uh, what it amounts to is she's got a job and a half. She's giving up, studies show that she cuts down on sleep, eating, uh, time eating, uh, time watching television, time reading, time visiting with friends, time in recreation. Uh, she cuts down on all those things. And her husband, when she goes to work, doesn't cut down on any of them. He doesn't spend any less time on the television, any less time sleeping, any less time eating, any less time doing any of those things. And, uh, Studies from other countries that have had that division of labor for longer than we have tend to show that that's one of the most resistant to change, to social change. In Eastern Europe, it's the same. And they've had 40 years of experience with uh, women working. Um, now, it's not true that no families are changing, but it's true that the, that the number where the husband is much more involved, which, as you might imagine, uh, the, the more flexible roles tend to be more educated families, families where the, where the woman is a daughter of a woman who worked, um, where um, they're uh, more likely to be white, middle class, and so on. Uh, but those numbers where there is more flexibility are offset by the number of families where the husband has two jobs and therefore is doing virtually nothing where the woman is, if anything is done, it's done by her because he's working two shifts and, or a, a shift and a half and uh, he's virtually an empty, occupying an empty role uh, in the family. So that the balance comes out much unchanged uh, and if I'm not mistaken, some of the steam is going out of the movement too so that in terms of consciousness raising and so on, uh, it appears that this round went to inertia uh, in terms of division of labor in the home. Um, who knows again what the future holds. I've never been right yet, so I don't see any reason why I should make a prediction. Um, now, there are some things that have changed and appear to be stabilized in a new level altogether. One of them is living together. Um, people have always lived together without marriage. Um, interesting, the Marvin case in California uh, was about, in effect, to establish common law marriage uh, that is, that if you live together as though married, uh, then the law treats you as though you were married. Um, but uh, that's not fully resolved yet. Uh, but the numbers of people of every age who are living together without marriage has 
tremendously increased, not just here but abroad. Places like Sweden, for example, have gone up from uh, 4 or 5 percent living together without marriage to 12 percent in just 4 or 5 years, and we've done uh, much the same. It appears from various studies that about 25 percent of our young people will live together with someone at some time. That's a lot uh, when you consider how much greater it is than the very small numbers which used to do that by comparison. But it's not just young people. 15 percent of all the people living together are over 65. Uh, it's a phenomenon of the uh, Social Security system, of course. And, uh, and the largest, uh, although the largest number are young adults, uh, there are very substantial numbers in their 30s and 40s, divorcees and others who are uh, living together. And um, curious, just in terms of tying in with what I said last time, people who live together are just as traditional in their division of labor as people who are married. In fact, they don't seem to differ very much from people who are married at all. They're less likely to have children, uh, and they stay together less long. But in terms of how their satisfaction with their sex life, the way they divide the money, uh, uh, their general morale with each other, um, even, there's some evidence, even the pain of breaking up uh, is not materially different from married couples. And, uh, that's curious since they got into those relationships to avoid all that stuff. Um, most of them marry after a period of time. Uh, but as I've indicated, marriage is occurring considerably later than it used to. Um, another change that seems to have stabilized, although there haven't been any large scale studies in the last year to really update. That is, if 75 was the saddle point, and there's been any change in this next thing, it, we don't have a study to, to mark it. Uh, but that's in sexual activity of the unmarried um, and extramarital activity of the married. Um, one of the most phenomenal changes in our time have been the number of unmarried who are sexually active. Um, even in the most conservative places, I haven't seen studies done here, but um, take Georgia, which is a uh, pretty conservative group. Uh, in a five-year period, they went from 78% uh, uh, of the women who said it was immoral to have sex outside of marriage to 20% who did. Uh, now that's a five. That was a really dramatic shift. That was just sort of one class went through and the next class was, <laughs> you know, came through with a whole different thing. 30% uh, of the graduating seniors, one national study showed, uh, are, uh, national senior girls uh, in high school are uh, sexually active. Uh, that's just a tremendous increase. A uh, study at, the U at Utah State University found 5% of the undergraduates in uh, 58, I guess, were non virgins, 33 percent in uh, 68, and nobody's willing to let them do the study in 78 because uh, they don't want to know that bad, <laughs> you know. Um, uh, but studies that have been done on reasonably conservative campuses where they have followed students through from their freshman year through their graduation find that on the average um, all but about 20 percent have um, had sex relations before they get out of college. And that's also, other studies show that about, that's about the number of people who have sex first with each other on their honeymoon is about 20 percent. Those are not, those were in different states, but um, that's about the range. It looks like, and it just has flipped over. It used to be the 20 percent were the, s the active ones, and now it's the 20 percent that are the inactive ones. One interesting study was done in a Midwestern college that classified the sexual styles, uh, Anguilli's study, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, I'm not sure I am because I don't know the person, but um, found that there were three styles of, there were, there were um, the adamant virgins, that is those who by, as a matter of principle were virgins. There were the um, simply inexperienced virgins. They had not decided to be stay virgins, they just hadn't got around to becoming non-virgins. Uh, um, you know, they were living at home and the opportunities just were not there kind of thing. Um, and there were the reluctant non-virgins who were 
looking for a hustle and couldn't find anything. You know, there was <laughs> nobody. Uh, then among the non-virgins, uh, there were the liberated non-virgins who, as a matter of principle, believed that sex was good and um, it ought to be up to anybody. If you like somebody else, you know. And there were the committed non-virgins who saw sex as a part of a committed relationship. And the committed relationship was the justification for the sex. <clears throat> and there were the confused non-virgins who used sex in their own life to get other things that they wanted and didn't know how to get and would themselves have been the first ones to say that sex did not serve them well and yet they found themselves involved in it a good deal. Um, because they were trying to get love and appreciation and feelings of adequacy and things like that that it was not, it was not coming through with, it was not producing. Um, now, that is a frank change of the most revolutionary, uh, as recently as five or six years ago, people were still saying, is there a sexual revolution or is, are we just talking about it more? And the answer is very plain. <laughs> there is a sexual revolution. People are getting pregnant from it. You can't get pregnant from talk, you know. <laughs> Uh, in, uh, in the United States in one recent year, uh, um, there were 100,000 uh, abortions to unmarried women um, uh, and 100,000 who got married. Uh, now that's just the different ratio than we used to have, um, who got married in that because of pregnancy and where the tr pregnancy terminated in marriage rather than abortion. Um, now, all of that suggests that uh, our styles, and as I say, no more recent studies have been done to my knowledge. Uh, if there's a new, younger, more conservative, more sexually conservative generation coming along, nobody's documented it. Um, in some ways, you might say, well, that would be consistent with the sort of uh, retrenchment Toward stable, long-term uh, uh, commitments and so on, but um, if that's so, nobody's documented that it's so, and and it may be not so. That is, people may not see the connection between uh, staying m staying married and uh, getting married and having children on the one hand, and not having sex uh, at early ages on the other hand. Extramarital sex is interesting. Men. Haven't there the whole sexual revelation? Revelation. No, that was a long time ago. This is revolution. That's more recent. Uh, men have not become more sexually active um, outside of marriage. Uh, that is, extramaritally, um, how they're married to a lady, having sex with somebody else is what I'm trying to say. Kinsey recorded about 50% of the men did, and the most recent Playboy studies and Red Book studies and so on, which are still not that recent, they're four or five years old, but still, uh, still show that about 50% of the men um, still have sex outside of their marriage. true that men are more likely to cheat on their wives early in marriage than women in their 30s and 40s. Um, Kinsey interpreted that. That's still true. It was true in Kinsey's days, true today. Kinsey interpreted it as a later blooming of sexuality in women. Um, I don't believe that myself. Uh, I just think that women have small children and uh, all kinds of impediments to an affair when they're younger and when they get the kids in school and their husband's involved in his job and they, they notice a certain emptiness in their life, I think they're uh, more vulnerable to that kind of thing than at early ages. It's still true, incidentally, the latest studies show that um, if you get along well with your spouse, you're less likely to get involved outside. Now, one of the most interesting things, though, is that sex in marriage has increased. Why should they be the only ones out there having any fun? <laughs> you know? uh, the number of times that couples have sex who are married has steadily increased over this. So there has been a sexual revolution in marriage as well as outside of marriage. And uh, apparently all this bombarding with sexual material doesn't only affect those who are, uh, who are unmarried. 
um, or doesn't only affect people to have non-marital sex. Um, so that the number of times people, that uh, if you took Kinsey's averages, um, they would not uh, apply today in terms of the frequency of marital sex. So the day of sex uh, has arrived, uh, or at least we, who knows what's ahead. Uh, may look, make us look like pansies, or this may be looked on as a golden era of sex. Who knows uh, what the future holds. But uh, in any case, the best evidence that we have, and it's pretty good, up through the, uh, at least the mid-70s, is that there has truly been a complete reversal and revision of, of the attitude towards sex from being deviant behavior to being normative behavior um, outside of marriage and inside of marriage, too, uh, where it was always normative but sometimes infrequent, uh, still sometimes infrequent but less often so. Um, well, other things have changed that are less interesting uh, and other things that stay the same that are less interesting. Um, for example, moving hasn't changed any. Now they've done studies going clear back to colonial times. They found that the turnover in a town like Boston or Philadelphia during the middle of the 19th century was about 40 to 50 percent from one census to the next. Can you imagine what a drag that must be alphabetizing all the names in the 19 50, in the 1850 census in a town and then checking, patiently checking them off against all the people who are still there uh, uh, 10 years later and 20 years later and so on. But it turns out that even in rural counties during the uh, 19th century had terrific turnovers. The notion of a very stable American background is just not true. Um, and uh, it turns out that about 50 percent of us move all over, and about 50% of us stay put in the same state all of our lives. And that hasn't changed. As best we can tell by reconstructing from census and so on, it appears that um, about half of us are movers, about half of us are stayers. Now, I realize a town like this with the university in it has got a lot of movers through and in and out, probably a higher number than, say, Des Moines. I don't know. But um, contrary to our vision that with wheels and so on, we're but in the old days, they may not have had automobiles, but they dragged uh, their horse up and their oxen and so on, and they moved anyway. They always looking for something better. So to our concern, to our interest, that hasn't changed. The, uh, the number of relatives living in the home hasn't changed very much uh, over the last 100 years. Uh, in fact, since 1790, since the census was first done, it's varied. Um, between 6 and 10 percent, never more than that, of families that have other people living in the, other relatives living in the home besides the nuclear family. And uh, you might be interested in what the highest year was in that, since 1790. The highest year was it was a special census that was done right after the Second World War. 1946 found the highest number of, uh, of relatives living in homes because there were no houses. <laughs> Uh, we're not very uniform on that. Um, blacks and American Indians have more relatives living in the home in one pattern, the pattern being um, uh, the head of the household and their married children and grandchildren. They have many, many more blacks and American, American Indians have that pattern than the rest of us do. That pattern is very rare, however, among Irish and uh, Jewish and uh, Germanic extraction. On the other hand, there's another style where a uh, married couple have a, that are the head of the household. So the middle generation is the head of the household. They have a grandmother living with them or grandparents living with them. And that's more common among the Oriental groups in America. Um, so it's uneven. But as a nation, we've always had a few relatives staying with us. And another curious group, if this were a class, I'd ask you to raise your hand, but I won't here. This is so dignified a group. But uh, how many of you have had somebody else, not a mother or father, uh, living with you at some time or another? At any one given time, not a lot. But at some time or another, the number of families who have had a cousin or a nephew or a niece or a stray uh, from uh, some other family that you're helping because they don't get along with their folks or whatever, the number that have had such people live for several months or years with them is 
extraordinarily number, there's only like 20 percent of us have had um, somebody live for a protracted period of time with us who was n not in a, a grand, not in the li line of descent at all, but some collateral kin or non-kin, um, not counting maids and that sort of person. Um, so some of those things that we think of as being different are much the same, and we go right on along the same way as we have for generations and generations and generations in our family of Western nostalgia with its uh, everybody living in one place all their lives with all the kin around and the grandparents living in and so on existed and exists today in uh, some small number of families, but not any greater numbers then than now. So the American family, as we move into the 1980s, is a lot more the same than anybody would have guessed 10 years ago when everybody was writing articles on whether or not it would survive and, and whether the family was suited to human needs or whether some new thing would evolve and uh, all that looking back on it seems kind of uh, amusing uh, perhaps. Uh, I, I know I've got a client who was a young building burner of the 1960s literally uh, and uh, he's now making television commercials uh, as a producer and uh, he said he found himself working on a gallows wine ad and suddenly said to himself, that's one too many. I can't, I have struck against gallows wine, I have thrown rocks through gallows wine trucks, I have burned gallows wine uh, car automobiles, you know, of gallows wine employees who were going, you know, I cannot, I cannot sell out and do a gallows wine commercial. So. So he didn't, but he did a Camel's commercial instead, you know. Uh, anyway, um, uh, he didn't sacrifice very much. Um, but an era seems to have passed, and we're in a new era. Not quite like the 50s. A lot more sex for one thing, in and out of marriage. Uh, a lot more living together. Um, but with those two exceptions, and the later marriage, um, not so different from the period that we came out of. Um, now, I um, rattled on a lot of uh, statistics and data at you for a while. Uh, there are, I suppose, all kinds of implications of these numbers, but why don't I stop for a minute and invite you to uh, ask me questions about the American family and uh, as we approach the 1980s, uh, and um, or make comments or confessions or. Uh, whatever, um, because I really do think that we're always a little behind in our, we're always viewing the future in terms of the immediate past and, uh, and since we are at such a crucial saddle point, since 1975 seems to have been the turning point when we turned away from the existentialism of the previous uh, decade and into uh, a more conservative, more family oriented, more the birth, the general birth rate is up. Um, more, pardon? Well, the it looks like it's creeping up about a uh, tenth of a point every two or three months right now, and um, I, I don't want to misquote, but uh, it bottomed out at about thirteen nine or something like that, and it uh, is now back up. Um, in the higher teens, but I'm not sure where the, I don't want to, I don't want to misquote that. I saw the numbers and I, I'm blocking on it and I don't want to. Well, it always, even at its lowest point, it was not a great many people having no children. It was a lot of people having two children rather than three, four, and five. Um, and not a lot of single, not a lot of only children. It was always more people just having exactly two children. That's what, that's what brought it down. Um, and now, uh, some are going and saying, what the hell, let's go for three. <coughs> and, but people are not having large families, but they're, but they're uh, you know, they got two girls, they're going for a boy like they thought they wouldn't, or, uh, or whatever. And a small number of, as I mentioned, that, that group who were never, who swore faithfully they were never going to have any children, and in fact, may have been sterilized. Uh, Oh, that's one change. Um, contraceptive techniques have changed dramatically. Uh, now, 
the most popular contraceptive technique is sterilization. And uh, for couples who've been married 15 years or more, 50% are sterilized, one of the others are. It's just a terrific number. It's just, um, 50%, half of all couples who've married 15 years or longer, one of the other has been sterilized. Just a tremendous, and it's about 50% either way in the white population and in the black population and Chicano population, uh, the burden of sterilization is heavily on the woman. But among whites, it's just about 50-50. Um, the pill is almost going out of use now among women who are over 35. It's still the number one contraceptive for young wives. Um, in fact, of all contraceptives, there's about a third who are sterilized. It's all starting from marriage to menopause. About a third are on the pill, about a third are sterilized, and about a third divide all the other ways uh, up among them. Um, and that's a very, very different pattern than we had 10 years ago, very different. Uh, and sterilization's on the increase. I'm not turning back, even though unsterilization is also a current right now. I should tell you, though, it only costs a few bucks to get sterilized. It costs uh, about 10 times that much to get unsterilized. Uh, but but as people look at the alternatives, the trouble is that everybody has lost, all, everybody is very much aware of all the price involved in all the various forms of contraception. There, it's, there are no wounder, wounder drugs, you know, they're all, they all have side effects uh, that people are very conscious of. And so uh, it's out of that wariness, I think, that sterilization, when people have got enough children, all the children they want, they sterilize. Yes. Thank you, Carl. If you want to see Carl another time, you'll have a chance on the Mary Brewbreaker show. This week? When is, do you know what?